November we're doing a proper tour and going Ireland, UK, all over Europe. It's been a while yeah. since I've been living off Tesco meal deals and <laughs> crappy Travelodge hotels, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to that life again. My little brother bought Goblin. Okay. Yeah, classic. And he hated it. And he was I like, would. This is, he's like, this is trash. I don't, I don't <laughs> want this. Do you want this? My brain is like a blender. I just like look at stuff and then it just chops it all up and then spits it out the other end and kind of like, where does that come from? Like, you know, when I'm out on a run or like in the gym or something, that's usually when most of the ideas come in terms of writing. <laughs> of course, I thought it was like some sort of, like, you know, God playing a joke in you or something. I'd love to make a feature. Okay. Um, I don't know when that would happen. But yeah. One day, one day. Yeah, in the future. <laughs> After we get the Grammy, we'll get the Oscar. That's, that's the idea. Right, I'm joined by Dublin's own multi-talented artist, producer, and filmmaker, Kojak. I first came across his music with the release of 2018's Delhi Daydreams, which was quickly followed up by the Green Diesel EP alongside Luca Palm in 2019. His much-anticipated album, Townstead, dropped earlier this year to much critical acclaim. And not only is Kojak an extremely talented artist and producer, he also directs all of his own videos, which might add to some of the most creative and forward-thinking visuals being released right now. And if that wasn't enough, he also co-founded and runs Soft Boys Records, a label releasing some amazing music from Irish artists, including friend of the show and former guest Gap Tooth. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to say congrats on the album. Um, yeah, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, I'm looking forward to chatting to you about your influences, uh, digging a little deeper into the album itself and the visuals. Um, but before all of that, how are you doing and uh, how's the reception of the album been for you so far? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for that lovely intro. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> the reception's been good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a funny time to be releasing music, but we've got some gigs coming up, which have been good. And I played one in Rough Trade, which is like the first gig that I've played since 2019 I think so it's nearly two two years how, how was that going back after that long for me it kind of I just like fell right into it it was funny you know it's been two years but I, I didn't feel nervous at all you know like sure. the performance side of things is really my favorite part of the music because the stuff can be a headache yeah. you know trying to write and trying to produce and record and sure like yeah, 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 yeah to do and all and it can be a lot of stress, but the performance side of things, I always feel like is that's like match day. You know what I mean? Like the practice is done, so I'm kind of like yeah. ready to slip back in. So yeah, it felt great, man. And we got to play like the album pretty much start to finish, and you don't really get to do that no. um, often, especially when you're kind of touring and stuff. So that's kind of I like that because we spent so long on track listing and it flows nice. a certain way. So it was cool to kind of be able to go front to back with it with a big audience yeah. people so and you've got you've got a tour booked in haven't you i guess at the end of this year is it yeah we're tour i mean i've got like all points east and a couple of festivals and stuff and then in awesome. november we're doing a proper tour and going ireland uk all over europe and um, so yeah i'll be looking forward to that it's been a while yeah. since i've been living off tesco meal deals and <laughs> crappy travelodge hotels so i'm looking forward <laughs> to that life again nice so yeah so this first part of the interview i just wanted to kind of like dig into your like influences like how it all started for you how you got into music and the the first thing i wanted to ask was um what sort of music were you hearing in your house like like growing up what was what was on the radio what were people playing you know my ma is a massive fan of horse lips so okay. we used to we used to have like loads of horse lips and like leo Sayre and yeah um you know the Bee Gees and all that kind of stuff and Growing up, I've got like older brothers, and so they would have put me on to a lot of music. So for years, it was like indie rock and stuff like that. And I was in like bands and that sort of thing. And it wasn't until I was like 15 or 16 that I started kind of getting interested in hip hop. Sure. Um, and that really just like opened my mind to a different kind of side of music that I've kind of been ignoring in a certain sense. Sure. And uh, do, do you think like the music you were hearing like when you were younger, do you think that's kind of seeped in into what you're creating now? Do you think there's like influences from that sort of stuff? Like, you know, music, 
it, yeah, it always kind of comes back in in some way, shape, or form. It's yeah, I don't know, because like, I listen to loads of stuff. My my taste is real eclectic. It's kind of anything like I was in mad into like Phoebe Bridgers at the same time as I was into like kind of you know, um, JPEG Mafia and like yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, it all seeps in with a bit of horse lips in there as well. So, <laughs> what I mean, I don't, I haven't heard any horse lips influence in any of my tunes. So, I don't no, know, yeah. really. I mean, for a while, it was kind of I was trying to emulate just the hip hop I was listening to, and I, it's kind of only been in the. Well, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like, especially with this album, it kind of the sound of it really feels more like me. Sure. Yeah, and um, an interesting question I kind of I like to ask people is what can you remember what the first like album or single that you bought like for yourself when you started getting into music was? See, I was just I I had the uh, privilege of having two older brothers that were mad into music, so okay. really I just I stole their CDs more right. than I bought them myself. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. Around the time that I really got kind of like fanatically into music, CDs were kind of come going out. Okay. Know? So um, I can't. I honestly can't remember, but I, I do. I my little brother bought Goblin. Okay. Yeah, classic. And he hated it, and he was I like, would. "This is." He's like, "This is trash. I don't, <laughs> I don't want this. Do you want it?" And so he gave that to me. We had a little CD player. Um, in the gaff, and I used to listen to that non stop. Tell you what, my little brother's kind of he bought Stevie Wonder's greatest hits when he was about 10 or 11, and we shared a room, and so right. that was getting blared non stop like every single day. I know that record like back to front, I know it's his <laughs> greatest hits, but all the track listing and stuff. So that kind of feels like the first CD I ever bought, even though I didn't buy it. Yeah, so that's like- the first one that I knew, you know, like back to front. So your brother had like great taste, even from like ten years old. Straight My in there. Brother, yeah, he has like a freakishly good taste, you know. <laughs> and he's a sicko. I I always say all oh, my brothers are better at music than me, you know. But um, yeah. So he put me on to loads of stuff, which is usually usually the other way around. But mm. anyway. <laughs> and then, like moving on from there. Um, what, when did you start to, you said you were getting into hip hop. When did you start to like your, yourself try and try and write or, or get involved in making music? I'd say with the hip hop stuff anyway, it was definitely Yonkers was like a watershed moment for me anyway. Okay. It, was, <clears throat> it, it was just kind of like unlike anything I'd ever seen. And at the time, I'm not sure how much he like Tyler had a couple of interviews out but the music was just so off the wall and like demonic I was kind of just got obsessed it was kind of like who is this fella making this this music it seems mad mm. uh, he seems like he's from another planet you know so I got really obsessed with it and kind of just from listening to their tunes a lot and, and getting more into the back catalogue and stuff I kind of think the the ethos that I got from it anyway was just like do it yourself and sure you know don't give a fuck what anybody else thinks of you and if you have some sort of like vision or some sort of idea in your brain and it just keeps niggling at you and you can't get it out and then do it you know what I mean sure and so that was like a big proponent of me actually making my own tunes kind of like deciding I was going to do hip hop and stuff and obviously from there you once you have some artists that you're obsessed with you kind of like go back and try and figure out how they started and you look at all their influences and stuff and yeah so i think that was a big kind of watershed moment in terms of me making my own music yeah and uh yeah you mentioned uh tyler the creator and, and yonkers there and uh like watching all of your your visuals and, and and hearing a lot of your music can kind of kind of see that influence obviously like the shock value of um of that video where he's eating the cockroach um you can kind of see in some of your videos that that shock value is that something you've you've tried to include in in the visuals that you do um i don't know if it's shock value but sometimes i just get obsessed with an image or um 
or an idea and rather than try and like intellectualize it I kind of I'm just like just do it and see what it means afterwards and so I think that's kind of where some of the ideas come from just like a weird obsession you know in my head I'm kind of like or just that simple need of wanting to see an image on a screen a certain way yeah um yeah I don't know my brain is like a blender. I just like look at stuff and then it just chops it all up and then spits it out the other end. And I'm like, where does that come from? Like, you know? Yeah, yeah. I know. I get you. Um, and yeah, so yeah, you mentioned Yonkers. Uh, and I asked you for a few tracks which which had influenced you, um, the music you make now and influenced you on your, on your journey. And that was a track that you said you first listened to that got you into making music. So um, yeah, let's get into that track now and uh, we'll come back on the other side. So I'm back here with Kojak and for the second part of this interview, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your creative process and how you went about crafting the new album, Town's Dead. Um, so when when you're making music these days, what normally comes first for you? Is it the, the music? Do you work on the production or is it lyrics? I like to write the lyrics with a beat behind okay. it, you know, but that doesn't always, um, it doesn't necessarily end up being the beat that those lyrics get coupled with, you know, so sure. sometimes yeah, yeah. it's listening to someone else's music, just being inspired by that or listening to someone else's beats and stuff and being inspired by that. Um, but the odd time, I don't know, you know, a terrible thing is like when I'm out on a run or like in the gym or something, that's usually when most of the ideas come in terms of writing. <laughs> of course, I don't know it was like some sort of like, you know, God playing a joke in you or something, but it's always, you know, have a pen and a pad around. That's when the yeah, best yeah. ones come. So you're out on a run and you're like, I oh, know I'm not going to be home for another 25 minutes. So I can't forget this. And you start like writing it in your head. <laughs> <clears throat> but apart from that, like if I'm sat down somewhere, it's usually a little beat behind just sure. mumble some stuff that's kind of like rhythmic so you get kind of flow in mind and then kind of reverse engineer words to kind of fit that flow you know sometimes so. sure yeah and um what sort of i know the people that listen like i said there's quite a few producers that listen what what's like your sort of production setup i know you produce a lot of your stuff your own stuff yeah ableton okay. and machina are like yeah, you can do a lot with the two of them, especially sure. using machine as like a plug-in in Ableton just because I bought like a machine micro okay. uh, when I was 19, I think. And they're brilliant. They're based off the MPC. So mm. what I like most about them is you can really kind of get out of the screen and you're on the controller. And once you kind of figure a way or around it it's it's pretty easy to like get a sample pulled in and sure. then not have to look at the screen again until you've got a loop but uh, apart from that like all of the sounds that come with that whether that's this like the one shot drums and stuff which i think are like some of the best drums sure you know um especially once you get into processing and, and as well as that like machine uh massive and monarch and uh oh, yeah. kind of contact and stuff they all come with machine once you get like one of those controllers so i sure. think that controller was like 300 quid or something at the time it was maybe, maybe got over to sale yeah yeah you get a lot for that but you get guitar rig in it as well and uh-huh. yeah loads of stuff drum lab yeah native instruments are nice yeah yeah no i've got a machine but i'm like i'm so used to just working in the box that i haven't just sat down and and just messed with it enough to just uh yeah, I need to sit down and, and get into it because so many people tell me how great it is. Yeah, it's sick, man. It's it's really good. Like, especially for beat heads, I think it's probably the closest thing to getting an NPC without having to drop, what, a grand or two on a fucking sure. old yeah, vintage yeah, yeah. thing that you're probably going to have to get repaired. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, so speaking more specifically about, about the new album, um, when did you start working on it? And uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about about the album itself? I had the idea for the album probably like five years ago, I'd say. Because okay. I had, you know, the skeleton, maybe five tracks. It was like Jinty Boy Blues, Black Sheep Part One, Curtains. Um, yeah, like a couple different others. No Hands is there as well. Sure. And I kind of had this 
narrative that I thought would be a nice way to link all those tracks. But I'd say, and you know, I've just been writing consistently over the years with that narrative in mind. So if a track was like a story driven track and that story didn't link up with this narrative that I already had, well, then that would come out on like Delhi Daydreams. That would come out on Green Diesel, you know? So, um, yeah, those two records are almost like offcuts in a certain sense. There was tracks obviously okay. specifically written for them, but I always had the album in mind, if that makes sense. Not to sure. diminish them, because it's all music, it's all art, they're all meaningful, but um, they didn't fit in with that narrative, basically. And right. then I'd say probably to January 2020, I was like, all right, album mode. I'm going to sit down and because I've been talking about this for five years, I'm going <laughs> to sit down and actually like produce it all. And that means sure. finish tracks and that means finish vocals ready to be sent in to mix. And I'm going to figure out what's staying and what's going. Sure. So, so were they more like, like skeletons of tracks than that you had the, the ideas that you said you've had for, for years then? They were like good demos, you know, okay. like the vocal was pretty good, but yeah. in, terms of like even simple stuff like going back and recording um the vocals so that it doesn't sound like me five years ago because right, yeah, yeah. that all i think that all kind of contributes to an overall sound and like a cohesiveness and like yeah. matching energy i thought was like an important one because there were certain tracks that were really good and the lyrics are really good i really liked them but my delivery was just not as confident as it is now and so right. i just had to go back and like inject a bit more energy into them <clears throat> and then yeah so the album's probably finished up then in november 2020 is that right yeah november 2020 i'm right. so bad at the months man i always have to count them on my hands i mean <laughs> like this last year two years seems like a blur doesn't it like i don't even know what yeah. year we're in now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> god knows but yeah so probably from january t- and then i got it finished in finished and mixed and mastered in november okay and it came out in june 2021 nice and after that point it was like video time which is yeah. weird i've never usually it's always very last minute and i've never had all the tracks and have been sitting on the tracks and thinking of the you know with just the idea of thinking of the visuals and stuff sure so nice and i might be completely wrong but um listening to the album um some of the tracks like curtains and sex and drugs and no hands it sounds like there's a much more like live instrumentation on it is that is that something you did did you did you record those with like musicians um or was that completely wrong no that's it so um there's not like live versions i suppose okay but uh, i did get like that was another thing that i did a lot across the record was I had people play on them. So like curtains, for example, I had my little brother do guitar. He okay. played guitar and bass on that because he's a fucking ripper. Uh, he played guitar and bass. And then I had Ryan Hargett and do some extra keys and saxophone. Ryan is across the, the entire record. He's like, he's really like, yeah, the bedrock a lot of those songs because he kind of just links all the tunes together and they can kind of sound quite disparate when you take them apart like i don't know going from like sex and drugs to like falling for it or whatever those two song- sounds are so uh, like different you know sure. but i think the saxophone across the record is what kind of ties it all together so and yuli is playing trumpet on it as well he's another irish artist and okay so i took a couple um i also got a string quartet i forgot i did that no, so that was yeah, mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never done how that. Was that yeah, how was that? Rec- did you like write those parts? Or did you get someone to write? So the- I wrote coming up. I did the strings for coming up, but yeah. I don't really have music theory. So I just kind of, I know a bit of chords and stuff and yeah. I know what I think sounds nice. So that took me about three weeks to do. And yeah, I, I did all those strings in machine just with the stock plugins that come in the machine. Nice. And then gave that to uh, a fella, a friend of mine, um, Phil is his name, Philip Keegan, and he's uh, he plays viola and he arranged it for me basically because he can write music. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, 
he arranged it and organized the string quartet and they came to my gaff and we recorded them out like of a music room in my shed so nice. we recorded them out there and uh yeah so i did the strings for that my older brother did the strings for curtains and then i did the strings with peter bryan who produces his brienne for wicked tongues and so mm. we just did that in the session that we had with them and that was like cherry on top kind of stuff you know it was like I've, yeah this yeah i've never done something like that before so that was amazing nice and uh, also you you've got some amazing guests on there as well like guest vocalists um you had maverick saber and um celia tiab is that how you say it yeah celia tiab yeah. um how did those collaborations come about um is that something like you're thinking of when you're making the tune or or are they people you thought about after they were you'd done your parts well with casio i had the whole track recorded and it was like a really lush instrumental already uh and i think i'd done an intro to it with that big deep bass because i got the beat off the count he's a producer from um i think he's from canada he's a sick beat yeah. maker oh but yeah he does he, all the, the videos right all the beat making videos that's yeah, him, yeah. <laughs> so good. yeah yeah but he had lost the stems for the beat so we couldn't mix it um okay. so i decided to basically just like fade the beginning of the beat in and do just like a simple like you know that that deep bass that you hear at the start of it yeah and it just kind of like came to mind because i've met maverick before just playing gigs and stuff and he's a really nice dude and he's really supportive of uh you know the hip-hop kind of scene and stuff like that and he'd been very supportive of my music in the past and I sent him the track and I was like there's two things I'd like I'd like if you could double up the the chorus and you know add your own harmonies and I'd also like if you could try and do like a choral introduction you know loads of layers and sure and just see what you do and come back with it and he sent it back like within a week and I was just like oh my god this is insane. Like the hardest <laughs> part of that track was to arrange it because I just wanted to keep all the vocals he did in. Right. So good, but he sent me about a hundred different takes, you know, all laid <laughs> on top. I was like, this is crazy. And with Celia, um, Celia has, we I came across her music from Brienne. Okay. And uh, she had sang on one of his really early songs that we put out on Soft Boy. Um, I think it was Can I Lie With You? And they just met over uh, SoundCloud. Okay. And so um, I loved her voice. I loved the tone of her voice. And there was like, I don't know. I think I was kind of thinking of like a couple little high vocal bits from like Good Kid Mad City or, or mm -hmm. It's Pimp a Butterfly. They're just nice little embellishments. Um. So I asked her to sing on the end of coming up and I asked her to sing on uh, Sex and Drugs. And I think she's kind of like across a couple of different other ones. She's actually does a little bit of vocal layering on Casio as well. Um, not quite enough for it to be a feature, but you know, she's there. And what I really like, I think the effect that that gives is kind of like, I think it adds to like making a, a kind of world because that happens on a couple of different records. like. I don't know, Tyler does it and mm -hmm. Kendrick and stuff. And um, yeah, I think it just like adds to this idea that this is its own little universe and there's reoccurring people and um, reoccurring themes and sounds and stuff. And so sure. she was great to work with as well. It's also Big yeah. Pig sings on Wicked Tongues too. Oh, she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, Rachel's going to re -re's on the end of that too. Uh -huh. I forgot that. So they got them hidden, hidden guests in there. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah uh, i don't know you get to the end of a project and it's like kojak's new record but really it's for it's loads of people helps sure. make the thing you know but yeah. yeah um and yeah you just mentioned um kendrick there um and the second track i asked for was a track from your favorite favorite album ever what did you go for can you remember i i went i was it was a toss-up to be honest but i went with uh sing about you by kendrick lamar off good kid mad city Okay, and uh, why why is that your favorite album ever? Um, it was tough to pick this one to be honest because I, I was 
it was between this and and uh, these walls of To Pimp a Butterfly. But I think I went okay, with yeah, yeah. Good Kid, Mad City just simply because it was in terms of the concept and how cohesive that record is, how interesting the storytelling is, the sonics, sure. the energy in the record. I mean, this particular song I think is beautiful. Just it's it's a long song and um. And he's got these three amazing verses with that refrain each time, you know, promise that you'll sing about me. Kind of that idea, it's like a very primal idea of just, you're on earth, everybody knows you've got like a certain amount of time to be here. Sure. You want to feel like you're going to be remembered when you're gone or to leave a mark. And he, he manages to tell this story from three perspectives. Like one sounds like a gangbanger at the start. The second is from the perspective of like a local prostitute and then the third is from his own perspective and he links them all so beautifully. Mm. Um, I just think it's like an absolute masterpiece in in terms of songwriting. So that was why I picked it. Yeah, no, it's it's a great choice. I think I'm split on, I think Pimper Butterfly is my favorite of the two, but obviously both of those albums are unbelievable. And I think it's, it's Anna Wise, isn't it? Singing on a singer on, on both of those records that you were talking about, these walls and sing about you. I think you're Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, like, let's get into that. That's this is uh, Kendrick Lamar saying about you. Okay, I'm back here with Kojak, and for the final part of the interview, I wanted to talk a little bit about your visuals, touch on your label, and also talk about what's coming for the rest of the year. So, first and foremost, I just wanted to say how incredible all the visuals are. Like the attention to detail definitely doesn't go unnoticed. Um, I read in a couple of interviews that you, you studied fine art at university, was it? Um, do you think that's kind of given you like a clearer vision of, about what what you want to present with your visuals at all? Uh, yeah, it was an extremely like influential time on me. You know, it, it was four years that I really enjoyed. Um, not all the time. There was a lot of times that I felt like dropping out, but that's kind of yeah. art college for anybody who's been to art college. You yeah. know, when you're putting your heart and soul into something and you get crushed at these like group crits where these lecturers that don't understand what you're trying to do just tell you your stuff is derivative or shit you know that's crushing and <laughs> oftentimes bet. it kind of was just like why don't i just do music but i'm very glad i kind of stuck it out because i think it's been so influential on the music as well like so sure um i got big into filmmaking in my final year um and yeah, and uh, that was that was super helpful because I, I had to kind of make a lot with a little, and I think that was a mentality that I took into the music videos because sure. I was very poor. <laughs> and um, well, yeah, when you when you're creating a song, um, what what comes first? Have you ever had it where you've had an idea for a video first and then had a song come from that idea? No, I haven't. Um, I do kind of, when I am writing the songs, I do like to try and treat them as films nearly, you know, okay. like, you know, how can this be like, how can I create something sonically that you can see, you know, and something that feels like cinematic and that you can follow the characters and stuff like that. But when sure. it comes to music videos, I'm kind of like show, don't tell, you know, or tell, don't yeah. show. So sure. I don't really like to make music videos that is just a representation of the story in the song. I kind of prefer to treat it as its own thing. And how can okay. you take this song that has its own meaning and put it in a new context right? Um, in order to kind of create something else out of it? So, which is, which means twice as much work. <laughs> And um, what what's been your favorite video to make so far? Towns Dead. Yeah, definitely yeah, that's, that's a good video. Great video. Yeah, very stressful. Um, but in terms of like final product, I was so so pumped on that, and that was with Sam McGrath. Okay. And Sam was like instrumental in in all of my visuals to begin with. Like he was the the first person that was mad enough to agree to do videos with me with absolutely no budget and no experience right. between us, you know. He was just really into film and really passionate. And I was really into film as well, really passionate. Um, but neither of us had really done much. Right. Um, so it was kind of just like, 
a lot of how we worked was just storyboarding things within an inch of their life, you know. I actually got like all the notebooks from like town, like the, the storyboarding for Town Dead of Towns Dead I've got like here, which is like, you know, these are all the scenes from, you know, the, it's like it's like shot for shot. Yeah, yeah. But one of the reasons why we had to storyboard that so heavily is because the VFX was such an important part of it, and if you didn't have that planned in advance, like. A, you know, months in advance, then it was going to look crap. And that was the last sure. thing I wanted. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think Townstead was definitely the funnest. Uh, yeah. And I saw, I'm not sure if it was for Townstead or not, The there was a lot of like green screen going on. And someone someone had posted uh, like a video of uh, how you'd put it together. Was that the Townstead one where? Um, it where wasn't you... Townstead, but it was the same director. That was uh, Sam McGrath and that was for Schmelly. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we did the final scene of Schmelly is me tied to a crane above like the Dublin skyline. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's meant to be kind of, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, I suppose, poking fun at the redevelopment uh, of Dublin and the kind of, I guess, the erasure of cultural space for artists and stuff. Because you see, sure. I mean, before the pandemic, there was finally after recession where the cranes had like disappeared you were seeing cranes again but all that was being built as hotels and that's still the case right um, in dublin so uh that was yeah that was the intention behind that and it was jack needham or needham needlem <laughs> i've messed know. his name up but he's in the credits of <laughs> schmelly and town's dead for okay. vfx and he was right. like above and beyond in terms of what he did yeah um, no it looks those sick. videos so yeah because, I mean, he made my head disappear for an entire video, so. <laughs> yeah. And um, you also, you, you released a short film as well, uh, Love in Technicolor. Was that, that was last year, right? I think. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, my final year piece from college. Okay. Um, and I think at the, in the time, it's kind of like, that was really peak lockdown. And all I was doing was consuming videos and stuff and, People had seen, I'd only ever exhibited the film um, at different shows. And afterwards, everyone was always just like, is there any way that I could see it online? And I kind of felt it was more of a piece that you would exhibit rather than, uh, you know, have like an online link to it. I just didn't really feel comfortable at the time because I felt so much of it was the environment that you watched it in. That was as much a part of the artwork as anything, you know. Sure. But, um I think in the times that we're in, it was kind of like the film, a lot of it is kind of, you know, loneliness and masculinity and love. And I kind of just felt like it would be good to release it just so people had some something else to watch as well as like mm. being able to enjoy it with a bunch of people. So I was glad to, have, to be able to do that. Nice. And that is that something you'd you'd like to do more? Would you like to make like more short films or? Yeah, uh, I'd love to. Feature? I'd love to make a feature. Okay, um, that'd be sick. I don't know when that would happen, but yeah. One day, one day. Yeah, in the future. <laughs> After we get the Grammy, we'll get the Oscar. That's, <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> um, and yeah, so moving on from with the visuals a little bit and onto um, Soft Boy Records, um, which you started with, with Key and Kavanaugh, right? Yeah. Um, why did you guys decide to start, start the label? What was the idea behind that? Sorry, you got a big WhatsApp beep there for my for my laptop excuse uh, me should have had okay. that on on silent i guess like a lot of it was just looking around dublin and and at ireland as well and just kind of being like you know there's no label here that's putting out music that i would want to be a part of or that i think mm. is doing anything that's innovative or sure to be honest like modern i think a lot of the labels quite antiquated still you know and they have like an old like early 2000s cd era of thinking about right, music yeah. and i'm kind of just like times have changed you know and i was looking to put out music keen was looking to put out music we knew it was going to come out anyway so why not just make it a little faux label and we could send around emails and that would like legitimize it you know that way right. yeah yeah so part of the intention was because it was necessary from our perspective 
the other part of it was kind of to try and legitimize ourselves. Right. Yeah, we've all done it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and it helped a lot because I think people kind of saw it and were like, cool, I could do that. And there was this idea of like involvement in a kind of community that you build through that. Sure. Um, because the fans of the label are really, um, they're real loyal and stuff and, and just kind of like, they're, yeah, they're super supportive as, as well of like all the music we put out and the merch and stuff like that. So sure. yeah, it was a great decision and it from my, from my point of view. Yeah. And, and the music that you're putting out on there, is that all, all from people, you know, from friends, how, how do you go about finding like new stuff to, to put out on the label? It's mainly happened organically, um, and it used to happen a lot through gigs. Okay. Meeting people either in the audience at a gig who, you know, are telling you about the music, you go home and check it out, or you go and mm. see someone play, and you're like, wow, I'd love to do something with them. Um, so it's been a little bit tough the last year, just obviously because the pandemic. But, um, sure. you know, Gap Tooth was one of the first tapes we put out after mine. And he had just messaged us on, uh, I think it was SoundCloud back in the day, and sent on his tape. And I was like, wow, this is sick. It sounds like kind of Mad Lib, Knowledge kind of beats. And yeah, yeah. Uh, we agreed to put something out with him, and he had it done in, like within the month. And that was Motorola. And then um, he changed his name then to Gap Tooth. And yeah, still waiting on the next one. But I mean, yeah, Gatu's doing sick stuff now. I mean, I love all his like yeah, online yeah. stuff that he's doing in the Discord and his beat battles and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah, no, he's killing it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm a big fan of big fan of his stuff as well. Yeah, he's a great dude. And I mean, then of course we got like Brienne, who's produced you know a lot of my records. Um, sure. I produced with Brienne, and he we found through a friend. Um, you know, as well as like all the King Cavanagh stuff, and yeah, yeah, so. It's just kind of organically, you know, you just pick people up along sure. the way and as long as they're sound and their music is good, then usually we put them out. Yeah, sure. And yeah, um, I, of the three questions I asked you before, the last one was um, for you, uh, a new artist that you've discovered recently that you um, you could recommend for the, for the listeners. Um, can you remember what you, you went for? I went for... Now, I don't know if her name is pronounced Livy or is it live but yeah it's live dot e and okay. the song is lazy easier lazy eater bets on her own wellness likeness likeness that was it yeah I yeah i found this track um maybe a year or two ago i i think it would have been maybe from twitter i think maybe earl sweatshirt retweeted it or liked it or it could have been sage alcesser i'm not too sure She's kind of part of that breakbeat new wave of, of artists like Mike. I find her music is anyway, kind of sure. like Mike or you know Navy Blue or some of the newer L sweatshirt stuff. Sure. But there's something about her tunes that kind of reminds me like Erica Badu. There's a real, uh, just like a real sense of self and like a certainness to it, and it's also quite fun. Um, you know her attitude, I think, kind of really comes through in her music. So. I think her stuff is great, and I yeah. love that tune in particular. I need to. I, I've never heard of it actually. I'm going to check that out after this. But yeah, um, before we get into that track, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. It's been like a pleasure talking to you. Um, whereabouts can everybody find you online? What are your social details? I'm on Twitter as Kojak. I'm on Instagram as OG Kojak. I'm probably on Facebook, although I don't use it. Yeah. Yeah, apart from that, I mean, you got me on Spotify, all the good streaming platforms, the YouTube's there with all my videos and stuff, so you can check them out. And Perfect. yeah, tour and in March. No, tour is in not. November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not March. <laughs> tour is in November. So grab a ticket. I'm playing all of Ireland. I'm playing the UK. I'm playing Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris, all across Europe as well. So Yeah, so that's it. Go and listen to the album buy the album, buy some soft boy merch um, and grab tickets for the tour. But yeah, thank you so much for joining Jeez. me. Um, Thanks very really much, man. Love to chat to you.